Hi everyone, thank you very much. This is scary. <laughs> I'm afraid to now. <laughs> I want to touch this thing. <laughs> Thank you. This should be okay. All right. Um, thank you for everybody's attendance tonight, the Community Health Committee. If you're having any problems, um, Brandon, Delegia, what would they do if they're having problems? If they're, if anybody, chat. Okay. Please put it in the chat line. So I'm Lisa Gorley, um, chair of this committee, and we're gonna go around the room and introduce everybody in the room, and then we will turn to the individuals on the screen. Legia, go ahead, so they know who's here. I can't hear the people in the room. Ray Towery, city manager. There you go. John Moore, please turn it on. Our press is here in the back room. And let's go. Chief go Jeff ahead. Lynn, uh, police department. James Page, uh, Samaritan. Thank you. Um, Christy, you're on the top of my list. I'm looking at. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Christy Walker from Sweet Home School District. Kate. Hi, I'm Kate Hall from Senior Disability Services. Thank you, Dick. Hi, everybody. It's Dick Knowles, just community member. Okay, thank you. Julie, are you on the line? Is that Julie or somebody using her? Okay, all right. And then it says Ray and Brandon, is there anybody below that that we can't see? Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Um, so with that, we will go to the approval of minutes. Has everybody had an opportunity to look at the minutes? Any changes that you'd like to see made at this time? So moved, motion to approve. Do we have a second? second. Motion has been moved and seconded. Um, any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, motion passes. Minutes have been approved. We're going down to committee reports. The community health fair group. Um, Dick, would you like to report? Uh, actually, I don't have very much. We're uh, still struggling with whatever is going to happen in August, and uh, it seems like every time it looks like things are going to get better, it, it waffles a little bit. Uh, and um, Bob and I are actually trying to work on something that'll be a little more virtually oriented and maybe work with some of the, um, maybe half of the vendors and try to do something uh, along that line. Um, the med school continues to aim towards uh, a virtual all day event. And I'm trying to work with uh, Dr. Davis to figure if they figure out some way we can't. Uh, I don't think our joining them would make any sense, but it might be a way to pick up some folks who can't attend that. Um, uh, and uh, she and I have been working on that actually for a couple of months. Um, and I think that's about it. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? OK, with that, we will move on to um, Western University. OK, the mentoring program is still going strong at the high school. Uh, next month, April the 19th, uh, we have a presentation scheduled. Uh, at six o'clock to do a Zoom, and I will need to know who I need to contact at City Hall to send out the invites to the people that uh, were inviting to the meeting. So I'm not for sure how we go about doing that. Yeah, just get us that list. 
Just get us a list with email addresses and we can send them invitations. Um, it should be, I think now, just the same invite and then we would just give them the ability to. Okay, okay. Yeah. very good. That sounds great. I will make sure that they get it. There will probably be about seven or eight people that will be presenting that. So we have students, we have medical students, high school students. Uh, we have the staff that is running the program. And uh, it should be a good evening. We should be able to hear quite a bit about what they're doing. So looking forward to that. Uh, they did have a little fundraiser, the Mike program, which is the program that the mentors are using. They had a fundraising event this last week, uh, virtual, and they just they gave a little update on their program and, and what they do. And, uh, they made several thousand dollars for that little fundraiser. So congratulations to them. It wasn't necessarily the Sweet Home Kids, but it was the Mike program here in Oregon. So good for them. That's exciting. Any questions? Um, Larry, was that something we'd talked about maybe potentially inviting the school board uh, to that meeting? Was yeah, that... I thought I would probably get it to Tom and let him go ahead. And that. That's great. Thank you. Any more questions? Conversation? Okay, with that, we'll move on to the Homeless Action Committee. Um, I met with uh, the people from uh, FAC, the Family Resource, the Family Assistance Center, uh, online this last week. Um, the update on the shelter from Bethany and from them was that they are uh, in progress of coming up with their rules and regulations uh, for a more uh, substantial spot somewhere here in our community. We still have yet to find a site for that, but uh, as of now, there are only um, about 12, 10 to 12 uh, homeless people that are at the church. Um, 10 have already moved on to either families or friends and are actually uh, living with somebody right now. So that's a real positive. Uh, one is in the hospital or was in the hospital at the time of that meeting. I'm not for sure why, but uh, so the less desirables from what I understand are gone. I hope the chief feels that is the case. <laughs> they have not had the problems that they had several, probably two or three weeks ago. And it's my understanding that those people are gone. Uh, the tents, as people are moving out, the tents are being removed. Uh, the uh, foundations that they were sitting on are being picked up and stored. Uh, so the process of phasing out the camp is on its way. Uh, I know Bethany has an operation coming up on March 26th, I believe, and she is hoping that the camp will be totally disbanded by that time. Um, they are opening up since it is a relatively small group of people. They're opening it up to showers on Mondays so that the homeless people there can get showers. And they're working with Shem on uh, somehow or another letting them get access to laundering their uh, their clothes. So I guess that's happening through Shem. And the site should be totally cleared up by the end of the month. Um, like I said, I think there are still people working on trying to find a location for um, the transitional housing and hopefully uh, progress will be made in that. I know there are some people uh, discussing a location right now uh, this week with some individuals that they said to not say anything until they have more definite type information to pass on. So. I won't share any of that at this point, but it looks like there is some progress being made towards uh, coming up with a location. So hopefully that will happen. That's exciting. Um, any discussion? Questions? Anybody on the screen would like to? Remind me again when everyone leaves the uh, the church area. Well, there. 
they are hoping that they will be gone by March 26th. Dick. 26th, okay. Um, they've actually, I guess the directive was to be out by the end of March. Yeah, that's right. But, but the, uh, the minister is actually having an operation on the 26th, and she and her husband will not be able to, uh, to run it from the 26th to the end of the month. So they are planning on having everybody gone by the 26th. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much. That's great progress. Um, see no other old business before us. We're moving to new business with a report from Chance James Page. And um, do you want them to ask questions as we go through this or wait till you're done? Uh, you can ask questions at any time, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. It's yours. OK, just waiting for the slideshow to get up on the board here. Sweet. OK, so uh, my name is James Page. I am a uh, CADC2. Um, I am also a project coordinator on a rural health opioid uh, prevention outreach grant um, for Samaritan. And um, I, I appreciate the committee. Um, allowing me to do this training. I really appreciate getting to um, talk about stuff that I'm passionate about and, and hopefully um, provide some education and um, further experience, I guess, with uh, substance use disorders, um, recovery, addiction, treatment, all that good stuff. Um, when I asked to do the presentation last week, I thought, you know, what is the most important information to know when it comes to addiction and recovery? And I think a big part of it is covered in this um, PowerPoint presentation that I do um, that is titled Evidence-Based Practices um, to Re Eliminate, excuse me, Shame and Stigma. And so I figure I'd go through that and add some, some details in as necessary. Um, we'll kind of breeze through it pretty quickly because I don't want to take up everyone's entire Monday night, but um, nonetheless, uh, get to the important stuff. Um, so let's make sure I can click here. Oh, look at that. Amazing. Technologically, you guys are far more advanced than I am, so I appreciate that very much. Um, so. Uh, what is stigma? Uh, stigma is uh, a universal phenomenon uh, observed in essentially all cultures um, and even across species. Uh, according to Lincoln Phelan, st stigma occurs when elements of labeling, stereotyping, separation, status loss, and discrimination occur together in a power situation that allows them. So um, when we all think of, of maybe, or at least for me, when I think of my experience um, coming up as a child, and, and what uh, information I was provided about addiction was I was provided a story that painted someone as immoral or unintelligent or um, criminal or, uh, I mean, there, there's this kind of so many words that come up really. None of them talked about really what was actually going on for the individual, right? And I think as a result of, of our you know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, um, you know, uh, think about your kids or, or whatever narrative it is that we uh, paint in order for individuals to get better from their um, disease. Uh, we, we unfortunately have came to a place where not a lot of people are, are getting help and and the, the stigma is is prevailing. Um, in a lot of ways. And I think we can see it in our own communities, maybe with family members, maybe ourselves, right? We The, the, the opinions that we carry, um, the amount of services that are available, all of those things. But when you kind of pan out and you look at the bigger picture, really as a country, um, we haven't done much for this population. Um, I think mental health got a lot of attention in the 70s, right, with the deinstitutionalization of people where we're locking everyone up. We need to get them out of out of um, institutions and we need to provide so social services for them to get better. Obviously, that that didn't go very well. Right. Um, it was a really good idea, but it, it left a lot of people on the street and a lot of people without services. And we're kind of following uh, in, in my perspective, at least a very similar track with addiction right now. 
right? We we realize that that prison is not a good place um, to put someone who has a uh, drug problem, um, but nonetheless, we don't have a lot of other services available to them, right? Oregon ranks in the the near the near the bottom. 54th or something in, in availability or access to treatment. Meanwhile, we're in the top five in substance use disorder, uh, diagnosis, drug use, all of that kind of stuff, right? So we have a very um, interesting, well, not interesting, a very uh, problematic situation at our, uh, at our hands. Um, so let me move forward here. So it's a public health crisis. Hopefully we're all kind of aware of that. Um, two and a half million Americans, 12 and over, have an opioid use disorder. A hundred and, and these statistics aren't accurate as of today. Um, they're actually worse than this. Um, so this is a, a data from 2017. Um, so 197 people a day die from substance-related overdoses. So that's methamphetamine, cocaine, uh, opioids, the whole thing prescribed and non. Um, 20.2 million adults live with a substance use disorder. So only one in 10 individuals receive uh, treatment for their addiction. It's, I think, slightly under that as well. Um, so one in 10 people are actually getting help um, or actually getting access to the care that they need or, or, or they're willing to access that care is another part of it. Uh, so 47,000 deaths in 2017 related to opioids. So to put that in perspective, we had 15,500 deaths from gun violence and uh, 40,100 deaths from car accidents. So opioids doing more damage than than those uh, two. An estimated $740 billion annual cost to society, right? Very um, startling numbers. Um, so iatrogenic, this is probably a word that you haven't heard and you probably haven't seen because I didn't click the button. But uh, this is a very important word when we look at um, opioids and the presence that they have in our community and in society today. And what this word means effectively is uh, relating to an illness, whoops, uh, caused um, by, a medical, by, a me by a medical examination or treatment. So drugs may cause side effects, which can lead to I iatrogenic diseases, right? So effectively what that means is that the treatment is, is, is causing a problem, um, a iatrogenic disease. And the way that works with opioids, we are going to get into right now. So in 2000, anyone familiar with what happened in the year 2000? Sorry. I ask difficult questions often without much context. So, <laughs> yes, besides 9-11. So 2000 was about the time um, that uh, we took fentanyl off of the shelves. Or, excuse me, sorry, not fentanyl. Uh, ephedrine off of the shelves, right? So we took ephedrine off of the shelves, which meant you had to get a prescription for it. You had to show your ID, do all that good stuff. Right. So at, at this point, um, we removed the most common used precursor to manufacture methamphetamine, um, one that was readily accessible by most people who were manufacturing methamphetamine on this side of the border. In combination to that occurring, um, we also had Oxycontin, which you all may be familiar with the word Oxycontin, right? Oxycontin became the most uh, prescribed painkiller um, in the country, and it was it was it was touted as a non-addictive um, cure-all for chronic pain, effectively, right? So any person you had coming in for chronic pain um, was was probably often offered oxycontin, which in in equivalencies is much more powerful and addictive than most of the other opioids that we see being prescribed like Vicodin and oxycodone and hydrocodone all those things that you might be more familiar with right what you're seeing on the map um sorry i'm clicking two buttons and i realize i'm not clicking one while i'm clicking the one next to me here but what you're seeing on the map is the progression of fatal overdoses um from substance use related uh, causes um, over this period of time. So this map that we're looking at is going to go from 2000 to 2014. So the red spots are um, greater than uh, 20 deaths per 100,000. 
Um, and and as they go down in the, the rainbow there, it goes uh, to the, let's see, darkest color blue would be zero to two deaths per 100,000. So, so from 2005 to 2010, um, we see an a, a extremely um, a startling, um, puzzling, confusing, uh, horrific, right? Any of those words probably fit well. Um, progression in the amounts of deaths per 100,000. So all of those deaths or the majority of those deaths, at least, not all of them, but a majority of those deaths are, are related to this Oxycontin prescription craze that then turned into a heroin and fentanyl uh, um, laced situation, right? So 2005 to 2010 um, and then 2010 to 2014, Let's see here. Um, that's that's where where it kind of hit the fever pitch. Um, so you can see uh, most of the Midwest and West Coast, and then there's some significant areas on the East Coast where um, you know you're seeing more than 20 deaths per hundred thousand, specifically related to uh, in this case opioids and uh, more specifically heroin and fentanyl um, and allergies. I can't say that word. I apologize. <laughs> Analogs. There we go. Um, all right. So uh, they hit a lot of rural areas. Yes. And what I think we we determined throughout this process was that rural areas were even more liberal with their prescription um, pres with their prescribing practices. Right. So you might see on and especially in areas uh, on the coast, um, some of those smaller coastal communities had the highest opioid prescription rates um, in the state. So they were giving out the most, uh, you know, opioids of, of any place in comparison to areas like Portland and Salem and all of these big metropolitan places, you know, um, some of those smaller coastal communities and 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 even ones right right around us here, um, as you can see by the map. Let's see here. I'm not sure what. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, um, in looking at those deaths from 2000 to 2016, there was 20,100 deaths that were caused directly by fentanyl. Um, another 15,000 by heroin, and then you have 14,400 by prescription opioids. So all of those are in the opioid category, right? When we look at this and are all in some way, shape or form directly related to that prescribing practice that we had in the early 2000s. Um, cocaine, 10,600 deaths. Uh, methamphetamine was nearly 8,000. And then uh, methadone there down at the bottom at 3,000. Um, one thing I can say about our current trends is that meth methamphetamine is currently overtaking opioids in a lot of areas in terms of opi uh, overdose deaths, right? So the the HRSA grant that I'm on, you know, and a lot of other dollars went specifically towards um, combating the opioid crisis, right? And there was a lot of movement around how we were prescribing them, why we were prescribing them, and a lot of those practices have changed. And as a result, I would say of all this focus on opioids, methamphetamine has slowly um, uh, blown back up, so to speak. Um, not only that, but now we're seeing a lot more um, uh, um, there's a lot less definition between those two populations of people. When I was coming up as a counselor in this field, you would have, you know, your, your individuals who used opioids, your individuals who used alcohol and your individuals who used methamphetamine and all of those groups, right. Were, were very different and they kind of looked down at the other groups, right. The alcoholics were better than the methamphetamine addicts and the methamphetamine addicts were better than the opioids, you know, and so on and so forth. And so what has happened, um, at least that I've seen in the last five years, is that the methamphetamine and opioid use populations have merged greatly. And so now we see most assessments that we do with individuals whose drug of choice might be heroin, they're also using methamphetamine with some relative level of consistency. To go along with that, now you have um, distributors who are putting fentanyl in the methamphetamine now. 
So you have the same, you know, kind of problem that we had with heroin initially where um, people just aren't prepared to deal with the 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 actuality of, of how potent fentanyl is and how quickly you you wind up overdosed and um, in a position that that is much harder to get out of. Um, so the next slide here um, talks about the Oxycontin process. So Oxycontin had been around for a long time. It wasn't until Purdue Pharma really started pushing it in 2001 that um, it really got out there and is out there as, as it could have been at the time. Um, as I said, uh, Purdue Pharma got in a lot of trouble uh, as a result of Oxycontin um, and, and paid out a lot of money and is still paying out a lot of money because of the way that they marketed it. and and the the promises that it wasn't as addictive and that it had a really low rate of abuse potential and all those kinds of things um none of that was accurate at all and it put a lot of people in a really bad spot um so internalized stigma occurs um, when a person cognitively or emotionally absorbs stigmatizing assumptions and stereotypes and comes to believe and apply them to him or herself right so what I look at is when I meet with someone who obviously needs help, right? But they are bound and determined to not get any help, right? They're going to do it themselves, right? This is a problem that I should be able to fix in, in relationship to addiction, right? So they come in for an assessment, maybe because of DHS or the criminal justice system or whatever it is, and they believe that they don't need any help, right? And I think that a lot of times we reinforce that by this idea that, you know, just don't use drugs, right? You know, uh, you know, think about your, you know, think about your job or think about your kids or think about your family or whatever it is. We, we, we say these things and think that, um, there's some amount of, of internal gumption, right? Or willpower or, uh, steadfastness, right? That is gonna, that's gonna fix the brain. And, and for the people that I'm talking about, um, which is another important thing to address, that is not enough. Right. So you oftentimes what we're, we're we deal with um, with addiction is we, we, we all know someone who, who drank too much. Right. Maybe partied a little too hard on the weekends, you know, did all those kinds of things. And maybe they were the crazy one of the group. But um, when it came time for them to, to change their behavior, they were able to do so. Right. Their partner says, hey, I'm tired of how much you're drinking. If you don't quit drinking this much, you're out. Right. And they stop drinking that much. Or, you know, uh, you know, their kid says something, their employer says something. There's some intervention that occurs and their behavior changes. Right. That is one uh, subset of this population. And, and markedly, they might have a substance use uh, disorder. But when I when when I look at addiction and and what we're talking about here on that other end of the spectrum, these are individuals who use in spite of consequences, right? So it doesn't matter what my boss says. It doesn't matter what happens with the criminal justice system. It doesn't matter what happens to me physically. I am going to continue to perpetuate that behavior regardless. The reason that that is the case, right, is because my brain has shifted in such a way that it now believes that drug use or alcohol use not that there's a difference, right? Uh, alcohol is a drug. Um, believes that that next use is is paramount to my survival, right? And I don't have the slides in here, and I, I wish I would have put them in here. But when we look at the brain, um, it's exactly what's occurring in the brain with someone who is dependent on substances, as, as a as a substance use dependence. Um, their brain has shifted in such a way that now food, water, shelter and my drug of choice is all in that same area, right? So if you stop for a second, right, and and try to hold your breath, right? Just we can all stop, one, two, three, right? On, on three, we can all hold our breath, right? You all with me? Sorry, I'm talking real fast, so I wanna make sure you're with me. I know this, these are the things we hate doing in school and probably in trainings too, but nonetheless, I'm gonna ask you to entertain me for a second. Okay, one, two, three, we'll hold our breath. One, two, three. You guys still holding it? You still holding it? Who's already breathed? All right, thanks. Me too. All right, you can stop that now. But um, eventually what was going to happen, right, is there was a part of your brain that was going to jump in and say it's time for you to breathe now. And you were going to breathe. Um, it's that same function in the mind that that is that is driving that next use 
for someone who is dependent on drugs or alcohol. It's the same part of the brain, right? And we're not, it doesn't exist up here, right? Where we're moral and social creatures, right? Where, where um, we know to say please and thank you and we know not to bite our friends and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, it doesn't exist up here. It happens way back here. And that survival part of our brain that's not concerned with any of that other stuff that we often look to to be the solution for this problem. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Okay, so internalized stigma outcomes, right? Um, depression, decreased hope, uh, worsening symptoms, ultimately less likely to seek help. Um, thought there were some other pieces there, but we'll move on. Um, so how do we eliminate it? We eliminate it through contact, through education, and through language. Um, so hopefully, um, you know, you all are having contact with me, right? I am someone who uh, has a significant use history um, that was uh, pretty, you know, I was pretty far out there with my use. And in 2007, thankfully, uh, the criminal justice st uh, system stepped in and, and gave me a bottom that was uh, sufficient enough for me to be able to have an opportunity to change my behavior. And um, what that has given me a chance to do is it's given me a chance to have a life, right? It's given me a chance to be a productive uh, member of society, and it's given me a chance to to feel like I'm a part of society again. Um, and you know, oftentimes in this, in our fields, in my field, uh, you know, probably in Jeff's field, we deal with um, individuals who are in that stage of their disease that uh, is very challenging. Right. So the dishonesty, the uh, manipulation, the whole gambit of symptoms that come along with this thing. And um, as a result, we often can become really biased and of the belief that, uh, you know, it's a kind of hopeless proposition that we're faced with when we look at doing better. Right. So hopefully, you know, interactions with individuals like myself who, um, you know, can show up and do a training for you, right? Um, who can be trusted to drive a car again? <laughs> you know, all of those good things uh, that I have in my life today, right, are the result of of getting clean and having an opportunity to do something different with my life. Um, and there's a lot of us out there, right? There's a lot of people um, in the recovery field, in the recovery community, in the treatment field, um, who have turned their lives around, right? And so the idea is that it's very possible, and that maybe everyone doesn't get it on their first or second or third opportunity, but nonetheless, if we build it, they will come kind of idea, right? And, and one of the problems is we don't have enough of those buildings, right? We don't have enough of those places where people can go to get help and, and, and change their life. Um, and I know we're all, there's a community health meeting, right? So we're, we're all looking at the problems and trying to find solutions. Um, and one of those is I think, um, understanding that, uh, there's a solution to this problem and that um, it isn't just that pre-contemplative um, individual that comprises what addiction looks like, if that makes sense. Pre-contemplative, meaning they're not thinking about changing their behavior at all, <laughs> no matter how good of an idea it sounds, right, um, to you. Uh, so through education, so hopefully, you know, a little bit talking about the brain, talking about um, how we get into this mess, uh, at least partially with, uh, you know, prescribing and, and uneducated individuals taking drugs that they're not aware of are going to really eat their lunch in a, in a couple of weeks, right? Um, uh, through understanding just the whole nature of this deal. And then through language, um, for me, I really try to use substance use disorder. I say addict and addiction, um, which are words that, you know, have, have a bit of a negative connotation, but nonetheless, um, it's important to look at how we talk about this thing, right? Um, uh, there's a, there's a guy who has a quote, um, his name is Don and, and he says, if you want to kill something, you call it a weed, right? If you want to care for it, you call it a flower. Um, and, and really when we look at this addiction thing, a lot of, uh, the language that we use, um, can get, can get that way at times, right? Um. So let's see, I'm gonna skip through a bit um, if I can. So let's see, how long have I been talking? Does anybody know? 
25 minutes. Wow. Well, hopefully you're all with me here. Okay, so education. Skip through this here. So this is one of my favorite little um, anecdotes when it comes to this deal. Um, so what it says is wanted a magical connection. Uh, the predisposed brain of the addict is like a lock and the addicting substance, substance or behavior is the key. When the key opens the lock for the first time, the experience is, pow is extremely powerful, even magical. In the late 1900s, positron emission to uh, tomography PET scans showed that the brains will reward circuitry in people with a previous or family history of addiction lit up in a way the reward circuitry of those in the control groups did not. These studies and others demonstrate that addicts experience their, experience their substances more intensely than non-addicts. Right. So when I think about the way that alcohol affects me, it affects me differently <laughs> than I think it does a normal person. Right. Because when I uh, take a drink, I want to continue to drink until there's no drinks left to be had. Um, whereas most people, right, you get a buzz or you, you're feeling good, you're, you're having conversation, all that good stuff. Um, eventually, there's an end point for you. For me, uh, it, it it's a fire that I can't put out. Um, and so I, I relate to that. And, and at least the, the experience that I know of other people, it's a very similar one, right? Where everybody, you know, most people that I know have had a drink at some point in their life. Um, and I don't think that there was anything wrong with me having that initial drink at that point in my life. Right. But what happened afterwards was something I couldn't, I simply couldn't be prepared for. Right. No one gave me a thing and said, Hey, you know, if you take that drink, you're, you're off until, uh, you know, until you get some shiny bracelets, right? Um, no one ever told me that. Um, so is it a really a disease concept still? So in 1939, the doctor's opinion, which comes out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, says alcohol seems to be the manifestation of an allergy in, the, in some people. They are often able, intelligent, and friendly people. So, you know, the reaction is like a peanut allergy or something else, except it's uh, different, right? In 1956, the AMA, so it's the Amer American uh, Medical Association, declares alcoholism an illness. So that's a big point in this deal, right? Before then, it was pretty much a moral failing, and they locked you up in a padded room and um, would do lobotomies and, and, and all of those kinds of things to try to cure alcoholism. So in 2011, so this is how recent all of this stuff has been, right? 2011, ASAM's definition uh, changes to addiction is a brain disease. So it took four years of study and uh, consultation with 80 experts to come up with that. Uh, 2016, the Surgeon General's report on alcohol and drugs uh, and health, addiction to alcohol or other drugs is a chronic but treatable brain disease that requires medical intervention, uh, not moral judgment. So, and then 2000, lastly, in 2018, ASAM strategic plan, strengthen, focus on a full spectrum of addiction care. So prevention, treatment, remission, and recovery. So ASAM is the American Society of Addiction Medicine. Um, so one of my favorite quotes from um, Narcotics Anonymous, which is a 12-step program uh, of recovery, is sa it says that, um, I'm sorry, I'm not clicking forward. Oh, uh, I apologize. Uh, is that we are not responsible for our addiction, right? I'm not responsible for the allergy that I have, but I am responsible for my recovery, right? The same way we would look at diabetes or any other chronic hypertension, right? Um, you're not responsible for necessarily having uh, type 1 diabetes, right? But if you have to take insulin, you are responsible for taking your insulin, right? It's the same idea with recovery. So we're going to skip through this. This is all exciting stuff, but um, I know I said I wouldn't take up your entire Monday night. So, uh, all right. So relapse rates among chronic illness. So substance use disorders has about a 50% relapse rate. Uh, diabetes is 39%. Uh, Hypertension is up over uh, or up at 60%. And then asthma uh, right above... Um, substance use disorders at, you know, 52%. Um, so the reason I put this up here is one, um, anybody, if they need to, um, who has, or, or 98% of the country who needs to can access medical care for any one of these other conditions. 
right? Uh, as easy as as easy as can be to get a doctor's appointment, go into the emergency room if you need to, really, um, whatever it is. Whereas substance use disorder treatment, as I said, right, we're we're 54th in the country in access to treatment, right? So if you have an addiction issue, uh, you can't just go into your primary care. You can't just go into the ER and get the type of care that you need or the type of assistance that you need. And even if you do get some help there, it's very unlikely that you'll be able to get directly into a treatment center from that point. So then you're talking about all of this time. Um, and what happens during that time, right, is our mind starts to change or, or we need to go back to um, those comfort seeking measures or survival seeking measures. Um, so this is the access to treatment part. So it's about 90 percent of um, Americans have access to medical treatment, whereas uh, maybe one and one and a half percent, one and three quarters have access to substance use disorder treatment. Um, so real quick, we'll go through the language stuff. If I can get there. Sorry, I wasn't clicking forward again. I apologize to everyone on the screen. Okay, so uh, the lexicon of recovery dialectics or dialects. Um, so addict, uh, we use uh, as a self-identification word, right? So I can identify myself as an addict. It's less desirable when someone else identifies me that way. Um, liable to create some disconnection there. Alcoholic, the same thing. Um, substance abuser. So the word abuse is something that we're trying to get out of this realm. Um, it's happening very slowly, but but you can't really abuse a substance. You can misuse it. You can uh, take too much. You can do all sorts of things. But how do you how do you abuse? <laughs> how do you abuse it? Right. Uh, opioid addict, self identification, relapse, self identification. That's one that I still use in a professional context. Uh, I'm a work in progress as well. Uh, medication assisted treatment. That's one that's still being used pretty regularly. Um, what, what the preference would be is to change that to medication assisted recovery. Um, person with a substance use disorder. Uh, person with an alcohol use disorder, person with an opioid use disorder, all um, very good terms to use. Long-term recovery, pharmacotherapy, when you're looking at um, prescription drugs to combat the side effects of, of illicit substances, most commonly. Let's see here. So I want to, I guess, reiterate one little piece here, and this is from uh, Dr. Nora Volkow. She said, in all my years as a physician, I have never, ever met an addicted person who wanted to be an addict, right? And that's the, that's the truth in, in my, my experience as well. Um, you know, I don't know anyone who said to themselves or said to anyone else at seven years old that they wanted to be dependent on alcohol or opioids or methamphetamine or whatever it is, right? These, these are not people um, that I believe got into this situation uh, with the kind of information that you would need, right, um, to avoid getting into the situation in the first place. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, we use one one time and that that allergic reaction occurs, right? That that different response than than the median has occurs, and it's kind of off and running. And and usually it's a tiered process, right? I start with alcohol. I moved to cocaine, I moved to methamphetamine, you know, um, that, that progressive nature of this situation. Sorry, I've talked really fast. Hopefully not too fast. Um, now I'll slow down, right? So uh, I, I handed out a uh, pretest. Um, hopefully I answered all of the questions in the pretest for you, but hopefully you prilled, filled it out right prior to um, me answering them all. Uh, has everybody completed the pretest? Good. Okay. Is there anything from my really fast uh, talking presentation today <laughs> that, that stood out for any of you? You want to know the answers. Okay. Do that instead. Okay. Number one, we eliminate shame and stigma through three basic steps. These steps are perfect. All right. Number two, opioids are synthetic versions of this naturally occurring substance. I didn't give you the answer to this one. 
opium, right? So the poppy plant, mostly in the uh, Middle East or uh, now in Mexico, so South America. All right, so addiction is fundamentally an issue of willpower, true or false? Uh, naloxone or Narcan, uh, so that's the reversal agent, right? The antagonist uh, for opioid use in the brain. Uh, do we believe it reinforces drug use? Hopefully not. So something real quick, anecdote on that. When, uh, when someone who is using opioids and dependent on them takes Narcan, it puts them into immediate withdrawal. So it puts them in the worst state and the state of being that every opioid dependent individual works tirelessly day in and day out to avoid, right? And when you take Narcan, it's going to put you into immediate withdrawal. So that's flu-like symptoms, that's uh, incontinence, that's, you know, uh, the whole the whole gambit of opioid withdrawal symptoms. So the problem... There's two problems. Uh, one is that if the amount of opioids that they have in their system is uh, too great for the naloxone to take effect, then it doesn't work, right? And then it doesn't bring them out of an overdose. But um, if they take opioids on top of the naloxone, right, usually in, in the real immediate period of time, um, that the naloxone is still going to be in their system. So it's a process that kind of takes some time once you have naloxone in your system. Um, okay, which disorder possesses the highest relapse rates? Hypertension, diabetes, substance use disorders? Hypertension? All right. Did, what did you guys guess prior to me, me telling you? Okay. Um, and then number six, addiction can be best or can best be described as a behavior driven by survival. Yeah, and that, um, you know, if, if, I, I, I probably should have added that in. But um, when you look at the brain and the composition of it, the uh, desire or the craving or the instinct to use drugs exists in a part of the brain that is separate and much more pervasive than, than, our, than our prefrontal cortex, right? So our prefrontal brain is what we rely on to be good people, to pay our bills, to think about consequences out in the future and all that good stuff. And where addiction resides is in our uh, lizard brain, um, if you wanna call it that, right? Um, it's in that part of our brain that, that cares about fighting, uh, fl flighting and and the other uh, word that you would you would add to that uh, uh, procreation. Um, so it, it's not concerned with um, the way you feel about it necessarily. The way I feel about it, it's about survival. And if you put uh, an addicted person into an MRI and you scan their brain and you trigger them, you will actively watch the front part of their brain shut down and that mid part of their brain light up like a Christmas tree. It's one of the reasons we do all this stuff in recovery, you know, call your sponsor. I don't know how much of this you all are familiar with, but, um, you know, talk to someone when you want to use all that kind of stuff is because we have to get the front of the brain working again in order to actually work through that craving, right? Because if you're just left with your devices and that craving, that craving is going to convince you the, the best idea is just for you to use one more time. And don't worry, we'll never do it again, right? Um, so yeah, that is that is the picture, I guess, without, without a PowerPoint about the way the brain works there. How do you... So as just the same way that it's in effect a, a learned behavior, right? Um, because it is a behavior, right? That you, your brain or the substance is providing the reward, and and that process can take, you know, uh, one one time use or, or or six years to to get to that point of dependence. Um, you get it. You get away from that situation in the same way, right? By being able to work through one craving and then being able to work through two, and then you know progressively. Um, 
unlearning the behavior, I guess, or learning alternative behavior. So some ways, some specific ways of doing that are like de-escalation techniques. So like the five, four, three, two, one, right? Talking to someone on the phone about how they're doing and listening, um, going for a walk, you know, all of those things that we um, use uh, a lot in, in mental health uh, treatment, right? Those same skills that we practice of, of, um, of trying to work through, uh, what our brain is doing, right? Um, those fight or flight moments. Um, so all of those de-escalation techniques work, calling people, um, being proactive, right. And going to meetings and doing everything I can exercise. I mean, the, all the good stuff, right. All of those, um, skills that we learn, um, in the recovery process and, and being on the other side of it, even in de-escalation and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So these are things that the individual who has the issue has to, they can bring these tools there themselves. Yep. Or is it real, does it really rely on external influence to? I think it does rely on external influence. And the problem can be that the, the rewards in early recovery are few and far between, mm -hmm. right? So I don't necessarily feel, I don't get the same, uh, relief from de-escalation techniques as I do from using drugs, right? But I will get a much more long-term reward if I don't use that next drug, right? So it's about being able to deal with the acuity of the situation in the moment and and then continue to build skills and, and, and practices that you can uh, institute in order to keep moving forward. What kind of external influences do you think are the most important in this, um, in, in, you know, especially early on? They, a lot of people call it recovery capital these days. So, so having a support group of people around you who don't use drugs, right, is, is paramount. Um, having uh, people in your life that you can reach out to, um, even if it's just one person, I mean, that's a good place to start. Having a place that you can go and be honest um, without fear of, you know, reprisal kind of situations, right? So people can go to a 12 step meeting and talk about all the insanity of addiction and feel right at home. Whereas you can't necessarily go to Safeway <laughs> and talk to the cashier about those things without getting some funny looks. Right. So, uh, it, it, it's that process of building a support network, um, and utilizing the resources that are in place. So we have, you know, uh, celebrate recovery. If individuals are, um, uh, religiously or spiritually kind of driven, right? We have 12 step meetings that don't necessarily have the same type of, of religious connotation to it. And then we have other programs like smart recovery that are strictly cognitive behavioral based programs where it's like, you know, pros and cons lists and thinking through the, you know, uh, all that good stuff. Um, does that answer your question, Sean? Okay. What do you think the best way to initiate that is? The difficulty with addiction is that there has to be some level of willingness on the on the on the dependent individual's side, right? So it might start with just trying to find where that willingness is. So if you look at the motivational interviewing side of things, you know, it's like, you know, how much of you doesn't want to use drugs anymore? Well, you know, two percent. OK, well, how would we get to three percent? You know, what what is it that you like about your drug use? We talk about that. Right. And then what is it that you don't like? And 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 trying to build up that side of them. That's ambivalent, right, that 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 wants both things at the same time. Right. I, I don't want to deal with the police anymore. I don't want to deal with child welfare. I don't want to deal with all these things, but I also want to continue using. And so it's like uncovering that ambivalence, building up the, the, um, motivation and, and enhancing the motivation and then continuing that process. But if you have someone that comes in and says, Hey, I want to go to treatment right now, you know, those, those cases happen too. And so then we, we do everything we can to get them into treatment in a reasonable amount of time, which is not often right now. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's doing all of those things without, with while avoiding some of those pitfalls of moralizing and 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 rationalizing and all of those kind of things that we refer to as thinking errors. Um, right. Right. Setting measurable goals is huge, right? So, so maybe it's not that I get into treatment next Wednesday, but maybe it's that I. 
you know, weigh the pros and cons of what it would be like to be in treatment or, or, you know, starting, starting with where they're at and trying to build from there, as opposed to looking at where they're at and telling them where they need to be. Right. Where do you want to go? And what gets in the way of you getting there? Absolutely. Absolutely. But so, something I had heard was you can't just immediately replace that was something else and expect it to work. You can't just say, well, if you go work out every day, everything will be okay. True. That often doesn't work. Yeah. And for, for you know, there's always exceptions to the rule, right? Yeah. But, but for most people, it's not that, you know, I'm going to get a gym membership and just start showing up every day at 10 o'clock and that's going to be the solution to the problem. Because when you look at the effect that addiction has on our on our on our whole being right it's much more than just our physical health right and yeah you get some dopamine going and and those are all really positive things and i wouldn't want to steer any way anyone away from it but yeah just that is not is not sufficient right yeah. yeah just like you know just changing the people you hang out with is probably not sufficient or just going to treatment and keeping the people you've been hanging out with um you know they they say the only thing that we have to change is everything and that's that's kind of the truth when it comes to to this deal. No. Yeah. And some people are going to be angry at you, and and they yeah. still care about you and want you to move forward, but that anger is still going to be there. Yeah. And that's something that that's why sometimes family is not always the the number one go to person. Yeah. It, it it's it's often that we don't um, we don't we don't hear family the same way we would hear someone else a professional right or a counselor or a or a you know priest or you know whatever it is whoever that person could be in that moment it's often a lot harder to hear uh, a family member say those same words even if those same words are the ones that need to be said um you know the biggest thing for family right is not enabling you know they, they talk about detachment with love right so that's i love you and i care about you but i'm not going to support you in continuing these behaviors because if i do all i'm doing is helping you dig your grave um which is something we we, we try to get away but something that's extremely hard to do if you're talking about your kid or you know your your sister or your mom or whoever it is right um all easy things to say and, and really tireless, um, hard work to put in on a daily basis. Um, but work that gets easier once you, once you forge the path, I suppose. How many people have you seen go through um, a program like yours and succeed in their three, four, two years, seven and a half years, whichever? Um, so the, the the treatment center answer is that, you know, 80% of people who complete our program will remain sober for two years. And what the small print in that situation is, is that people that continue to engage with treatment effectively for two years will get two years clean. So um, the longer that people are in treatment, the higher the success rate is. The shorter duration that they're in treatment, the lower the su success rates get. Um, and so... I mean, I have from my time working out here uh, a handful of stories or, you know, anecdotes um, of people that are still doing it and, and strong in the community and the recovery community and taking care of their kids and, you know, doing everything they need to be doing. Um, but there's a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of people who, who, who didn't didn't get there. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, you know, as a us on the professional realm, you know, sometimes the best we can do is plant seeds, right? And be a resource for when they're ready. Yeah, absolutely. The challenge of serving our community in Sweden. What is it that's... Uh, access. Um, I think that in areas where you know, smaller communities where there's not as many social service providers. Uh, effectively, what happens is, is we don't see the individuals maybe until they get to the ER. So if we don't see them until they get to the ER, you know, if, if I don't catch them somewhere else in the community, which is hard to do because there's not really anywhere to catch them, right? I'm not just knocking on doors or, or, or that kind of thing. Um, 
I think accessing people, uh, accessing the population that, that we could have the most, uh, effect with. And then, um, all of the other stuff that that's normal, right? I mean, the, the transportation issues, um, you know, the socioeconomic issues, all that kind of stuff, but that's not, I wouldn't say the transportation is a bit different, um, because we are kind of removed from Lebanon so far, but, um, most of the other things I think are consistent issues within any community that you look at. Um, I think with places like Eugene, there's just, there's so many more social service providers and, and things that people are accessing those services and then encountering, you know, treatment professionals and, and things like that. Um, the outreach part of it is, is the main part of it for, for this grant. Um, and it's also kind of been the hardest one to really feel like it's, it's something that I'm achieving. Um, because a lot of the time it's, you know, maybe they come into the clinic and I, and I catch them there or they're, um, uh, go to the ED and we, we see them there. Um, but otherwise there's, there's not a lot of, of ways to reach people. So I've, I've tried putting a, a little article out in the newspaper. We put it out last week about what is opioid use disorder with my phone number, as far as resources are concerned and that kind of thing, you know, being here and, and hopefully letting you all know what we're trying to do. And if you have people or, you know, um, information that, you know, I can utilize to, to further what we're doing. Um, you know, those types of things. So I mean, being involved in the community court, you know, another piece, but, um, but it, it, it takes time, you know, and I think, I think for me, I'm more, uh, I'm, I'm an instant gratification kind of guy, as I may have shared earlier. Right. And so, uh, because it hasn't happened in the first year or maybe 18 months to the scope that I would have liked it to have, um, it gets a little, like, I get a little, a little agitated about it, but these things take time. Um, and so there's that reality as well. So when you were here before, you mentioned that the overdose rate had actually increased. Mm -hmm. Is there an age or um, an, an addiction level or time that that has increased? Is there something, what do you contribute that to? I know we have an economy issue. We have all kinds of stuff happening with people with COVID. Yeah, they... But the the covid piece um specifically the um increase in isolation so so addiction uh, alcoholism these things are diseases of isolation in that people are typically by themselves you know isolated they're not not talking to their family about what's going on you know all that kind of stuff so they get very isolated and then you add covid on top of that and it's even more disconnection which leads to i think more acute issues coming out um uh down the line and i think that the, the that it's a result of that specifically of just, you know, 12 step meetings not occurring, you know, all of these other things that, that did occur not occurring. So then you have people who might have been doing OK, who go back to use because they're they're unable to cope with the stress of life without those uh, resources at their disposal. And there is online meetings and that kind of stuff. But uh, you know, I don't know about you, but for me, it's it's not the same, right? Meeting in person and having these conversations is so much different than if I was at home talking to you all through the screen. I might have talked a little slower and been slightly more organized with my thoughts, but nonetheless, you know, uh, it's a different experience. And so um, those are the things that I would attribute it to. Larry, did you have a question? I do. You're grant funded, is that correct? That is correct, yes. How, what's the time frame of your grant, Jim? So the the grant ends um, September 30th, um, but due to COVID and kind of some other delays that we had initially in our hiring process and those kinds of things, we're looking at the potential for a no cost extension for another six months or maybe a year. Um, so uh, the, the 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 soonest that it would end would be September 30th, and then you know. Uh, uh, the federal government willing, we're looking at maybe another six months or year uh, extension. Is it possible to get something on a permanent basis? Uh, 
the sustainability. So part of the grant is is looking at sustainability and how can we continue to provide the services that we are continuing. And so um, that's part of the plan is looking at how we can how we can at least leave some of the services behind that we're providing right now. Um, my hope would be that we could provide peer support out here. I think that they're uh, invaluable um, peer supports that um, have experience and kind of know what they're doing. Um, are the most important resource that I have as a result of this grant. Um, there, I mean, they can go out to people's houses, they can transport people, they can help people get, you know, do all the things that need to be done on a much more personal level than what typically a counselor or, or you know, someone else can do. Um, so those positions, my hope is to, you know, continue to have someone at community court um, and, and you know, continue to be out here and, and tie in the rest of the services that we have in Lebanon to the community out here. So was the grant through Samaritan Health? The grant, yes. So it's Mid-Valley, but Samaritan, yeah. Okay, yeah. So is that tied in with the new facility that was just built in some way? It's not tied in specifically to that facility. So the grant comes from HRSA, um, which is a federal program that, okay. that yeah. Um, and they got the grant prior to breaking ground and all that kind of stuff. So it is a part of the uh, STARS kind of system, um, but, but not directly uh, in, in some ways, I guess. Does your program tie in with theirs and... Yeah, absolutely. On the individual. Yeah, absolutely. So we, I like to look at it like they're a, a, a huge resource that we have because they provide residential treatment. They have outpatient. They have other services there that we can tap into. But I like to get people where they're gonna be, where they, where they have the highest chance for success. And so if that means going out here to Exodus, then we, you know, connect them to Exodus Country Counseling, provide peer support, and do all that kind of stuff. But we're not just simply kind of a farm program uh, for stars. That makes you know, baseball analogy. <laughs> farm team. Farm club. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Thank you very much. That Thank was you. very nice. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, let's go around the room. Um, and got anything to report? Larry? No. Ray? Sean? Just add a little bit what Larry was talking about earlier in the homeless uh, report. Um, also, they're being required to go out during the day now, too. Um, they're not, really, not generally sitting there all day. So, so, <coughs> there, so. Okay. Thank you. Chief? Nothing on my end. Jeff, did you have anything else to add? Nothing from me. Jeff? Okay. Dick? Nothing from me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Kate? You still no, on? She had to leave, yeah. Okay. Christy? No, Are I you? don't have it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and seeing no other, no other business before us, I call this meeting adjourned. Thank you.